fellow, fellow YouTubers. Um, my name's Gary Monk. My name's Gary Monkford. And I used to be the MD of Temporary Guns Limited. Um, and I regularly posted um, um, videos for uh, deactivated weapons um, back in uh, 1919, sorry, back in uh, 20. 13, 14, and the early part of 15. I'm very sorry that I have been remiss in posting uh, videos recently, but unfortunately I've not been able to. And the reason for that is that um, as a result of a determined witch hunt by my local uh, constabulary, the West Mercia Police, I ended up in prison. I hasten to add, it was absolutely nothing to do with the deactivated weapons, although uh, I think um, it's pretty obvious that's what it was all about. Um, in future I'm going to be posting more uh, videos to explain the, the circumstances behind my incarceration uh, but for this video I want to um, answer some of the questions that people raised back in uh, 2014 and which at that time I couldn't answer uh, because of commercial um, advantage I um, everybody was asking me how can you do this how can you have what were essentially pre-2010 um, deactivated weapons and yet you were only deactivating them in 2014 or 2015. Um, the answer is that I know the law and that's probably what got me into trouble. Um, back in 2013 I had a, a shop a retail shop in Birmingham as well as a retail shop in Tembury and my manager there asked me if uh, he could sell airsoft and so we set that up and we sold airsoft guns so I'm not going to bother talking about that anymore but then he also said later that some of his customers had asked if you get deactivated weapons as well now a long long time ago I'd seen deactivated weapons at some show or other at Stanley uh, in uh, Warwickshire and I remember them as being, I mean, I used to be in the, uh, in the army, and, um, and so I've been around weapons for a long time. And my, my initial personal weapon was an SLR, self-loading rifle, the old FN valve that the British uh, uh, made their own. Um, and I can remember picking up a, a deactivated weapon way back then, probably around the 2000 mark. Um, and it would cock, it would fire, it would dry stick, you could ask. I think you could even look down the bore. But it was deactivated. You, know, you couldn't fire anything through it because um, bits have been uh, chopped up, bits have been welded, and so it was deactivated. Now, when my uh, manager asked me to get some of these, I asked him what he wanted, and I went off and got some. And if I actually bought them from D&B, uh, who offered me a, a, a joke of a, a discount for um, a, a tradesperson. But anyway, um, and when these arrived, I took a look at them and I was appalled. They were basically just welded lumps of metal. Um, Nothing worked, you couldn't pull the trigger, you couldn't cock the action, it wouldn't strip properly. And I was appalled at the state of these things. So I looked into the law uh, and I realised that, yep, that was the, uh, the current standard at the time in 2013. Um, and I thought there has to be a better way of doing this. So I'm not stupid, I'm fairly sharp. 
So I got out my books and I, I read the law from our soul to breakfast time. And the, uh, I read the uh, Firearms Act 68, the Firearms Act, uh, and, and all the others. Um, I think at the time in 14, when I was looking at this, there were 32 pieces of legislation which related to firearms of various sorts, VCR Act, uh, Firearms Act, um, 85, 87, just there were loads of them. So anyway, I read them all. And I came to the conclusion that um, the standards which the government were asserting in 2010 um, were not um, enforceable, and I'll explain why. The new laws to change the standards, first of all the standards themselves are only recommendations. Um, the law is very clear on that. Um, the guidance to the police is slightly different, but the law itself is very clear. Um, firstly, uh, the standards are those which, if um, applied to a, to a weapon, makes it a deactivated weapon, and which, if um, it has been certified by one of the two proof houses in the UK, um, that those, um, those standards have been adopted, it is presumed that the weapon is deactivated. It's a, it's a deact, and I'll call them deacts from now on. It is presumed. It's not a requirement for standards to be applied. It's not a requirement for marks to be put on the gun. <clears throat> and it's not a requirement um, for uh, proof of certification. Now, it is true that um, since uh, 2014, the law has changed somewhat all across Europe, and I'll come on to that um, later. But anyway, so it's a presumption. Um, and again, the law is very clear that the test is evidentiary, i.e., uh, will it discharge a, um, uh, a missile, shot, or other noxious substance through a, a lethal barrel? Um, and if it won't, then it's deactivated. So the second part of this is that when they brought in this new standard and the new law, um, they didn't make it retrospective, which means that a weapon deactivated to old spec, as it were, um, must be legal because it's deactivated, even though that specification has led to a weapon which isn't a welded up chunk of rusty metal, but actually could be cocked, uh, dry fired and stripped. But if those, if those weapons are, so if those deacts are deactivated, then because the standard is, the test is evidentiary, then any other weapon which has been deactivated to the pre-spec standard must of itself be legal because it is deactivated to exactly the same standard as another weapon which has been deactivated to the previous, uh, to the previous standard. So I thought, hmm, there's an opportunity here uh, to actually give people what they want because I, I went on a few forums on the internet and I, I looked at um, people's comments and everybody was looking for old spec and they were prepared to pay a premium and I make no bones about it, it, it was a clear uh, commercial opportunity. Um, so uh, just to sum that little bit up, I discovered that A, you don't need a proof house certificate, B, um, you don't have to weld it up and so it's a rusty of metal. Um, C, um, none of that stuff is required by the law because D, the test is evidentiary. Does it fulfil the requirements? Not has it been through a proof house, but does it fulfil the requirements? 
And lastly, of course, um, if uh, pre-95 um, or old spec weapons meet that evidentiary standard, then any weapon that is deactivated at standard is good enough. Now, um, I'm conscious that the law is um, well, certainly the law in England is based not merely upon the words of the law, which to me are fairly obvious, but also on precedent and case history. So a judge in his wisdom can decide that these words, which to another person might be perfectly plain and, and, and uh, indicate one train of thought, in his mind indicates a second train of thought. And if that judge is setting a precedent, that becomes established. Um, I, I, witness, I was a witness to that um, with regard to uh, blanks uh, and other matters, but again, later. And so I was aware of the, of the law being crazy. Um, so I, I had a, um, a customer at the time whose wife was a QC. So um, without holding her to it, uh, we exchanged correspondence and I said, is my interpretation of the law in your legal mind correct? And she said, yes. Um, that's a clear and correct interpretation of the law. Now I went on to one of the forums for, um, I think it was um, gun, gun not gun trader, it doesn't matter, I went on one of the forums and I discussed this and um, lots of people who claimed to know things uh, were arguing the task and they were clearly wrong but I took a bit of abuse. Um, but nevertheless with that, uh, with the backing of QC, I went ahead and bought some weapons from Germany. Now I thought if the Germans are certifying these things as deactivated, uh, Wolfsprung, Doch, Technik and all that, um, they're probably deactivated because the Germans know a thing or two about engineering. I thought that will help my case. And I bought a, a fair few of these things, maybe 20, 30, 40, I don't remember. And we put them up for sale in our shop. Um, then we had a visit from um, border control, uh, the firearms people at border control, to say, you've imported these weapons and we don't think that they're good enough. So I said, come along, come along to the shop and have a look. So a couple of guys came, um, one guy's name was Colin Buckley. I do know the other chaps, but I'm forgetting, I've forgotten their name. And he inspected them and he said, hmm, I think these are a bit dodgy. Um, um, I'm not going to nick you today, but um, and, and then I, I, I suggested to him the basis of my legal explanation. There was a wry smile, and clearly he knew the law as well as I did, and he knew I was right. He said, okay, well, um, what I'll do, I'll, I'll, I'll take some stuff away, and we'll check it, and I'll let you know how you are, how you've been. And I've said, okay, well, to show good faith, because I didn't want to get nicked show good faith, I will take all these off sale. And we did. We didn't sell any of them uh, until we heard back from him. And I had to chase him a bit uh, in order to get a response because I wanted to return on my investment. Eventually, he did get back to me, wrote me a letter, sent me an email copy. And it said, thank you very much for your... And I'll post this um, uh, on, on a website so you can read it. Um, it says, thank you very much for your... Uh, your um, uh, what's looking at people? Thanks very much for your help in this matter. Um, uh, you are right that um, uh, there is no need for food house markings or certification, and that the um, the um, deactivation standard is evidentiary, it's not statutory, um, and we are content for you to continue to sell them, most important. Uh, but we do warn you that um, um, we need you to make sure 
that all other sales are deactivated to the same standard. And I was over the moon. Um, I've been proved right. Uh, and we carried on and we went back to selling them. And, but, oh, but this was, I mean, this was never a big part of my, um, my, my gun dealing business. I, the two shops sold shotguns and rifles and air guns and all the usual paraphernalia of a gun dealer. Uh, but there was this little silence, so we'd sell two a week maybe, but mostly it was to discerning uh, customers. For example, there was a chap from London um, who was Jewish and he collected uh, Israeli uh, deactivated rooms and he'd been looking for a, uh, I think it was a mini user, I don't think it was a micro, I think it was a mini user. Um, deactivated to old spec, but of course that was impossible because that particular model wasn't available on the deactivated market until after um, 1995, so he was never going to find one. But of course I found him one in Germany, or maybe Austria. Anyway, I found him one. He was over the moon, and he bought a few more things from me after that. But that's what he wanted, and he was an ordinary chap. No, he, there's no way he a threat to anybody. Anyway, um, I should be, I should point out, of course, that uh, the only things in the 95 standard that really um, changed from the pre-95 standard was to do with self-loading rifles and so-called assault rifles. They should have called them selective fire because do you have defensive rifles and assault rifles? And, anyway. Um, so, um, at that point, um, I had a thriving business, and we were selling them quite happily, um, and we were legal. We issued our own deactivation certificates, which were more fulsome than the official deactivation certificates, because we actually said what had been done to the weapon. So you could see, um, which isn't, as everybody is aware, that it, that's not what you get on the British proof asset. Um, but that was the basis of how we did business. And I had lots of emails and letters from people, competitors as well, saying, how are you doing this? This, you, you, this must be illegal. No. I even um, had a correspondence with um, I've forgotten his name, but he was the guy who used to run um, FSU Connections, the guy who was importing uh, Soviet weapons, uh, which were coming from the factory in a, in a semi-manufactured, deactivated state, if you will, and which I think actually did break the law, and I told him so, uh, in that they were not uh, deactivated weapons, in that they were uh, originally um, working weapons that had been deactivated. These were made in order to... Um, uh, in order to be safe, to be deactivated, and therefore they were really imitation weapons, and therefore fell foul of the VCR Act 2007. Um, so I thought he was on pretty dodgy ground, um, and I didn't use that as a basis of my uh, legal activity. I told my uh, uh, firearms and explosives officer, my local guy, he was perfectly happy with it, a guy called Chris Van Heerden, he said, yep, yeah, that sounds okay to me, Gary. Uh, and I happily run a business. So that is the basis for how Tembury Guns were able to supply old spec weapons uh, that had only just been deactivated that year. Uh, and those are the weapons that you see um, on my channel at the moment on YouTube. So that's the end of this video. If you have any questions, uh, get in touch with me. Um, I'll, I'll post the, um, the email address um, so you can um, uh, get in touch with me. Because it has changed. Many things have changed. I'm now here in my um, East European, non-EU location because I've been 
my uh, operations have been driven out of the UK, driven out of Europe really. Um, but yeah, so uh, so now you know the basis of, uh, of how I was able to operate legally. Um, and on our next video, I'll explain uh, what happened um, that led up to my um, arrest uh, and incarceration. And it's uh, it's a horrible tale. But thank you for listening, and uh, I hope you watch the next one too. Bloody flies.